But um, we'll start off with just, I just want to thank you for, for allowing us to put this on film and sharing your stories and some of your career with you. And uh, the first thing I just want to ask is uh, how you got your start in the business. Well, I wrestled. Yeah, I went to the University of Oklahoma in 1956. And I wrestled at Oklahoma. Um, it was the first time I really knew anything about wrestling. They didn't have it in Texas, mm -hmm. but they had it in Oklahoma and New Mexico. And, and uh, so I was playing football, and then I, uh, I started going to the wrestling room every afternoon with those guys. And I get to be friends with them, and then I started, you know, learning how to wrestle. Mm -hmm. But and we're talking just amateur wrestling, right? Yeah, this is and it was hard because these guys were the top wrestlers in the world. Oklahoma was number one team in the you know the United States at that time, and I wrestled, you know, uh, all of them. I got my can kicked, but I got where then I after a while I could hold my own with. And uh, they were, in 56, they were a national champion. And uh, then I had a friend in Houston, Hogan Wharton was a, he played left guard and I played right guard. And um, he wrestled in the off season. He said, man, I did good money-wise. So I said, well, man, I think I'll try to get into it. So I, uh, I called this guy Anyway, as a promoter in Oklahoma, Leroy McGurk, mm -hmm. and I went to school there, and they were looking for an Indian wrestler out in Annapolis. They, you know, Big, uh, Big Heart was there, and Don Eagle, and they were all gone, so they wanted an Indian. So I um, called, and McGurk referred me to Jim Barnett, who was a pretty big wig in wrestling all these years. He used to promote Australia. And and he promoted Indianapolis then, and so they, they flew me down to Indianapolis, right out of Amherst, the election in Kentucky, really. But And they took a look at me, and they liked what they saw, and I went down there and trained for about two months, and then I started wrestling. Mm -hmm. And I've been wrestling, I wrestled 38 so years. So that was while you were actually in college? No, it was right at the end of my but, college. Yeah. Okay, because I think... At that time, you would have a problem with eligibility, right? If you were to, if you were playing football. Oh yeah, no. I, I started wrestling in '60. Yeah. I, I started college '56. Yeah. So right after college, you went, did you, you went straight into the NFL as well. You got drafted. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your NFL? Well, I was drafted by the Cowboys. Um, we went to uh, Oregon to train. It was. Uh, about 20 miles out of Portland, and uh, I trained with them for like, they had an extra, they were given an extra three weeks or four, I forget, but we worked out of there for a month. And then we came down and we played Baltimore at the Cotton Bowl, and I got my shoulder separated on the kickoff. So he told me, he said, well, we're going to, see, I didn't know that you can't cut a guy when he's hurt. But, you know, you don't know anything when you're young. So they said, well, we'll bring you back next year. He says, why don't you just go on home and heal up? I said, no. I said, I think I can play somewhere. So I called New York. Uh, Sammy Ball was there, and I've been drafted by him. But, see, they'd already played three or four league games when they cut me. He said, well, we've got our team pretty well made up. He says, well, we'll take you next year. I said, no, I can they had to play somewhere else. And I called uh, Houston. Lou Rimka said, yeah, come on down, we can use you. So I went down and, and uh, got there on a Friday. I worked out in shorts with them on Saturday. Sunday they played Dallas. And Hogan Wharton and Talamini were the first two guards. They both got knocked out. Legs tore up. They said, can you play guard? Well, I was a linebacker. I said, no, oh, I can try. So we played, uh, I played 10 games for them, and we won the championship that year. 
So I told him the next year, you know, I said, I, I, I'm not going to play guard. You know, I was only 230 pounds. And so they traded me to Denver. And I went to Denver, and I spent three years in Denver. And then New York traded for me from Denver, and I spent, let's see, two years in New York, and then three years in Miami. Mm -hmm. Did you have a particular favorite place that you played for? Well, for publicity and everything, New York mm -hmm. was probably the greatest because all the papers are there, yeah. and you get a lot of coverage. And you know, up there, you'd go somewhere and sign autographs, they'd give you 1500 bucks. You know, that was a lot of money then. Yeah. When I went to Florida, he was lucky to get 50 bucks. He, <laughs> you know, they'd scream about $50. Yeah. But, uh, but then I wrestled, you know, like half a year I'd wrestle, and then I'd play football half a year. I never took any time off, I really, you know. And none of the football teams had a problem with you wrestling on the... Cause you would, were you under contract year to year? Because at that time, probably everybody thought... George Wilson told me, and the sports writers, he says, if they're all as good a shape as Wahoo, I hope my whole damn team wrestles. Because <laughs> I stayed in good shape, and I wrestled hard, and it's not... Especially when he was in Florida in that heat all the time. But I used to wrestle long, hard matches, too. You know, hours, hours, out. And it makes a difference, but I... Well, in fact... We had a golf course by the training camp, and I used to slip over and play nine holes between practice. Mm -hmm. And he got on me. He says, "Man, you're making me look bad, and making me look like I'm not working, y'all." I said, well, "I'm not tired," and I wasn't. And, and uh, I'd, I'd like to think that I was probably as good or best shape of anybody in that camp. Mm -hmm. So at this time, wrestling was something you just kind of did as. Wanted to get a little extra money. Well, I worked in the, I just wrestled in the offseason. Yeah. Yeah. And then I started making more money wrestling than I did playing football, so that was it. Yeah. I started wrestling full time. So, full time in the late 60s, huh? Mm -hmm. Did you have any early influences in, in terms of wrestling, people that like really helped you out? or? Well, there was a guy from here that helped me up there a lot, it was Johnny Hyden. He trained me and worked hard with me. Uh, of course, you know, there was like Red Bestine, uh, Keller Kowalski, uh, Art Nelson, a lot of guys, all the guys went over and helped me. They were, you know, mm -hmm. brilliant. You know, like nowadays, you would never get getting them over there, but they all came and helped me, you know, and gave me advice. And, and I just watched them listen because nearly all the guys in the Indianapolis were main eventers, you know. Had all the big names there, and and I uh, and with the background I had from Oklahoma, I caught on a lot faster. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I think it, from about the second month I was in wrestling, I was a main event. I was on a main event. Sometimes I didn't even know what I was doing out there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it worked I, out good for me. I remember reading a lot of the old clippings and they would bill you as, you know, former NFL star, you know. So, you think that helped a lot in terms of getting you up to the main event really quickly? Well, I started on the main event there and that helped. It gets all over the country and then, you know, then I went, uh, I remember the second, let's see, about the second month I was wrestling, you know, they wanted me in Texas where I was born, you know, my home. Mm -hmm. And I went down there and I wrestled Lubbock, I mean Odessa, Lubbock, Amarillo, three nights, and we sold out all three places. But I played high school football down there too, you know. Midland High School? Was yeah. yeah, and then, you know, it, people came just to see if I could wrestle more and listen to nothing probably. <laughs> yeah. But I was making I made about seven hundred dollars that week. <laughs> then I went back where I was, and I made three hundred the next week. <laughs> but you know, it's just you know, wrestlers come a long way, you know, pay wise. Now you get a fairly honest. Well, I don't want to get an honest count, but they're making big money. And, uh, but then 
you had to argue over twenty five dollars. You had to guarantee you twenty five dollars. And you know, sometimes you had to drive three hundred miles for twenty five dollars. But uh, it's come a long way now, you know, they get guaranteed salaries. I think that hurt the business. Guaranteeing a guy because of you know if he's sick or got a hang down, he, he didn't want to wrestle. Yeah. So. Do you do you watch anything that goes on today? Very little. Yeah. I watch Flair scream a little, and then four or five guys jump in and beat this guy up. But my boy watches it all, kids. But I was sitting inside an the other night. It was probably fifty people. Came to me and said, "Man, they're, they're going to make their kids quit watching. You know all that stuff they're doing. Mm -hmm. Parents don't like it. You know you can't do some of the stuff that they do. And, you know they're trying to get the ratings and everything. But uh, hey, if you lose your kids, you're going to lose lose your audience. And I had at least 50 people come to me and you know mention the things they're doing, like yeah. you know and." and Kiss my ass and drinking a beer on TV and stuff. It's, I think it's going to hurt him in the long run. Do you have any animosity towards a lot of these new guys that yeah. you know, they don't put any dues into the business and they get big contracts? <sighs> well, it's just the times. Uh, well, I'm glad they're making money. Yeah. It's about time. You know, it's. Uh, it's hard to get a break, and if you get one, you make it when you can. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you get a break, you got to be able to do the job. And, uh, sometimes it's a long, hard climb. I was lucky; I got to start on top, and then I went from Indianapolis. I went to where my hometown in uh, Midland, and I wrestled there for two years, I believe. And, I think I went to Florida. I went to Florida after that. They were doing good in Florida. And then I, uh, it's like I went. I went to Australia. And I came back and went to Minnesota. And then I uh, came here. Then I went out and ran an office for three years in Florida. And I came back here and then I went to AWA for two or three years and ran their office. Mm -hmm. And I came back and I've been here ever since. Yeah. Here for people that I know is in Charlotte, North Carolina. But, um, you know, a lot of people have the, their gimmicks and stuff, and, and I'm sure most people know that, you know, you have Indian heritage. Can you talk a little bit about that? and? Well, my grandfather's full blood Choctaw. My grandmother's a full blood Chickasaw. They lived in McAllister, Oklahoma. Uh, my granddad was one of the first U.S. Indian marshals in the territory of Oklahoma. In fact, they lived there when it was the territory of Oklahoma. Um, just about all my kin folks are living in Oklahoma. They're all nearly full blood. My dad and I was born in Oklahoma. Then my dad was in the oil bill, oil business. We went to, we lived in Texas. They had a big oil boom in Midland, Texas. It was probably the biggest oil field in the world at one time. And we moved there, and I grew up from, I guess, 1949 to until I graduated in '56. I, well, my mother still lives there. And then I went to Oklahoma. I played high school football in Midland. I uh, ran track. Uh, played baseball. And uh, then I went to the University of Oklahoma. And then when I got out, I've been wrestling and playing football ever since. Yeah. You had a, uh, <clears throat> you have a reputation of being a legitimate, a legitimate tough man. And do you, do you know how you got that so quickly? Well, I think a lot of that had to do with the old days. These promoters were always trying to quiz you around. And I'd stand up to them. I'd grab them. I, I mean, I was 
I wasn't crazy, but I hey, I didn't I just believe right's right and right, wrong is wrong, and I, and I stood up. I mean, if he says, I said, I'm not going in the ring. You pay me my money, and I wouldn't. Another guy would say, man, I like that. like when I was working in Amarillo, and we went to Albuquerque on a Sunday, sold out the house. Uh, I was the main event. Uh, got the check, two hundred two hundred dollars. I said, it's not right. You know, we had about $15,000 house over there. I said, this is not right. Funk said, well, could you rather work $200 on Sunday or be off? I said, I'd rather be off. He said, well, I said, I'm not going back. He said, well, you're, you're going to have to quit. He says, well, we'll just have to fire you. I said, I quit. I said, I'm not going back. I walked out the door, right? All them guys come out there, yay, yay. Boy, we'd like to do that, but we got families. Mm -hmm. I have a wife and two kids, <laughs> about what, one and two years old. I didn't have another job. Picked up the telephone. <laughs> two days I was on a main event in Florida. But, you know, I just stood up and they knew it. You said that was for Funk? Was for Dory Funk Senior? Senior. Senior. Did, did you eventually go back to him or was that? Was that oh, I went back and worked yeah. for him later on, but uh, I was on a different position then. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just, just promoters sometimes, they just, it's unbelievable how bad and how much money they take. And you never knew actually what the houses were, you know, it was, it was tough. Mm -hmm. They didn't overpay you, I'll tell you that. <laughs> they sure didn't, boy. A lot of times they give you an envelope every night, you know. They, I said, don't, don't say anything, we gave you five dollars more. <laughs> you go to the other guy, well, they told me they gave me five dollars more, we count them, I think we both be the same. <laughs> you know, they just, I don't know, it's, times have changed. Uh, but we used to have to really fight over our money. Mm -hmm. But, gas was 11 cents a gallon. <laughs> You know, okay. I had a two-bedroom apartment and I had two cars, and I had $125 a month for a bedroom, two-bedroom apartment. So, you know, it, it, I, I lived pretty good, you know. And, uh, I'd go from wrestling right to football, and then football right back to wrestling. Mm -hmm. And it worked out good for me. So. But I, uh, I guess, <laughs> we're in Philadelphia one night, and the guy, Phil Zacco, he's paying in the dressing room. <laughs> He puts down, uh, I believe it was 400 or 500. And we had, you know, the stadium, Redskin Stadium made it full. Mm -hmm. yeah, but must have had 50, 60,000 people, right? I said, well, I don't need a draw. He said, no, this is your payoff. Man, I snapped. So I flipped the table up in the air, and all that money went everywhere. He went back in the football locker. He's a little bitty guy. And uh, they grabbed me and got a hold of me. Bobo Brazil and uh, Haystack. Then he saw me, had me. He jumped aside. He was getting, I, I shook loose. He fell down the locker and said, Oh, my heart, oh, my heart. <laughs> and I think they lost about two or $300. <laughs> Some of them guys picked up to give back. But I tell you, man, I, 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 I could. I had to stand up. I mean, I did. You know, I don't think it hurt me any. I think it helped me. And I don't know how tough I am, but I stood toe to toe with nearly all of them. Yeah. Well, you had to sometimes. The guys try. You got to. If you, you know, if they find out they can get you, you know, you got to stand toe to toe. There's always somebody going to try you. And I guess I knocked a lot of them out, so. <laughs> I probably couldn't knock out my little boy now. <laughs> so, uh, what were some of your memories of the days in Florida? Well, uh, I like Florida. You know, it was short weather all the time. You had shorts on. And I dove. I had a boat and I dove a lot, you know, underwater and fished a lot. And uh, played golf. You know, you can do it. It's year round play. It's. Um, I got to diving a lot down there. That was a lot of fun. You know, we went all over Florida diving, and we'd get 
get stone crabs and we would get crabs and we would shoot snook and shoot grouper and big you know, was, and uh, plus you wrestle, you know, you're home every night, which makes it nice and uh, you had to get hot weather, you drink a lot of beer. <laughs> And so did you, did you just move your family from Texas to Florida and then? Well, what I did, I, when I got down there to play, I had my family in Tampa. Mm -hmm. And then I would go down and play football in Miami and then I'd go back up on the weekends with my family. And uh, then one year I moved my family down to There on Miami Beach, uh, we were really, we lived on the beach one year there. And, you know, I had my family with me most of the time. And, uh, I know that one year I left them in Tampa. I'm, I, I commuted to Miami. And, and I wrestled in Florida, you know, and I was. It was a big card down there, and, and then they traded, you know, I was the first one picked in that expansion draft, you know. hmm. and uh, we'd be back to me and said, if you don't want to go, you don't have to, but they had a guy from Oklahoma that paid about 800 grand for them, they said, we're well, going to have to give him a chance, he said, if you want to go, you are, it's probably going to make more money for you, he said, go ahead, so I went, I should have stayed in New York and won the Super Bowl year. <laughs> And the guy that played there when I was there sat on the beach the whole time, and he, the other guy got hurt and didn't even play, and he moved up and played, took my position. Mm -hmm. I said, man, what a, what a smart move. <laughs> but I liked it. I was down there, and I was wrestling, too. And, uh, and I, uh, I enjoyed it, you know. And it's good for a family because you can get out and do stuff all, all the time. It's always warm, and there's a lot to do. You know, there's a lot to a lot to do down there. Good food, good restaurants, and play golf. I love golf, mm -hmm. and um, that's about it. Are there any particular matches or feuds that stuck out in your mind? Well, I used to draw real good. Was well, Valentine was there, mm -hmm. Malenko. down there three different times. When I was there it was like Louis Tillet, uh, Sailor Art Thomas, a lot of the old timers there, um, Tyson Tyler, uh, gosh it's been so far back, <laughs> that's 40 years ago. <laughs> But you know they had, they had Florida wrestling was big, yeah. and uh, they drew good and they paid good, and so uh, I was there, I believe three years, and then I went somewhere. You see, then it was it wasn't like now. You stay in the place a year, or maybe a year and a half, and you know you're burnt out to that area, so you you had to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. So you know you might go from. Florida to Carolinas, and the people never seen you here. So the TV didn't was Florida TV, and when you came here, as a, you know, if you weren't sending tapes in here, they'd never know who you were. So when you came here, you're new. So you'd stay a year or two, and then maybe you go to Texas, or maybe you go to Kansas City, or to California. See, it was different. It was territory, and I think it was a lot better for the guys. Now you're on that national TV, it doesn't make a difference where you go. They send you, they send you, they send you. Get, and some of these guys have got to burn out. And you know, because New York's changing back and and, and Turner's, they're, they're changing guys, but the people are still seeing you over and over and over and over. And, and after a while, you lose your you lose your glitter, man. But in the old days, you could go here, you could go to 10 territories in the United States. You could go to Seattle, you go to Canada, you could go to Detroit, you go to New York, you go to here, Florida,
Texas, uh, California, you know, they had offices and you, you could stay two years and just go around doing two years at every place. And, but now, you're on that TV, you know, they know you. And after a while, it's just like Flair. Flair is going to have to quit pretty soon. God damn, he's been here 25 years. You know, and... Uh, How do you think he still draws the best ratings for WCW? I don't know. I don't know. The way they do things, I don't know who does all that, but I think they got a committee that has nothing to do with the wrestling. I mean, I know it's got to be glittered up and, and, you know, the times, but half of them guys can't wrestle a wrist lock from a toe lock, I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. They're just big and muscle. Hulk Hogan couldn't whip my little boy. And look at the money he's made. Mm -hmm. So you can't say, I just think in the years to come, there's not going to be anybody with the knowledge anymore to teach them to wrestle. Where are they going to get somebody, you know? Because guys, hey, I went to Japan with a guy one time, and I'm watching him wrestle, and man, he was good, you know? I mean, and I never heard of this guy. Um, he finally went to New York, but he was in Japan wrestling. I said, well, how'd you learn? Who taught you? He said, I taught myself. He said, I watched TV, and I taught myself. And that guy was that, remember that Barry Horowitz? Tony, he was in Japan, man, he was going, he was, I couldn't believe it. I said, who taught you, man? He taught himself watching TV. And there's guys like that that want to wrestle that bad. And, uh, but, you know, a lot of the guys don't even know the basic, basic stuff. So, I don't know, there's just a lot of basic stuff you need to know. You got some of them guys and tell them they got a wrestle an hour and draw. <laughs> they wouldn't know how to go 15 minutes. I'm telling you, that's it's. But then they got so many guys on the card anymore and so much bullshit. We used to have no, no music. Mm -hmm. No music. You just went to the ring. You had your coat or whatever you wore. Or if you didn't, if it was hot, you didn't wear your coat. Uh, you let them have it, they rang the bell, you wrestled. They rang the bell, you got him, went back to the dressing room. You know, it was, it's a lot different now. You know, they do all that smoke and life, which I'm not saying it's bad. I mean, you know, I, it's just... Uh, it's just a different sport for you, huh? Well, I would say if one or two guys had the music, uh, you know, top guys, and a little bit of smoke and stuff, but when you got eight or ten matches, and it's the same. <laughs> you can get loses this thing, you know, it doesn't mean that much. Mm -hmm. I mean, but a couple of songs, you know, like a couple of main events, you got play their songs, and, you know, it's really built up to them, and they're really excited. But when you hear ten songs, or, well, you got eight matches, say 16 or 20 songs, I think it just loses it. Loses it. Of course, that's... Some guys, that's the highest point of their matches or something going to the ring. And uh, they got all that shit on and they get up there and dance and do that game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then when they start to wrestle and don't know shit, you can tell it too. Mm -hmm. But they're making money. So I'm not bitter, don't get me wrong. Yeah. I just wish I was able to wrestle now and come back myself. <laughs> but I, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm retired. I'm playing golf every day. and. I don't worry about it. I got a little boy, ten years old. That takes all my time, believe me. He tears up something every day. So you said you you did go over to Japan a few times. I think I was in Japan thirty-two times. Thirty-two times. You're better known over there than you are here. Yeah. The people know you over there like you like you're wrestling right here in Charlotte. You, you get off the plane, they know you. They know you in the airport. See, they got. That place over there is flooded with sports sheets, like sports papers and books that come out like every week. I mean, they know everything. Japanese people know everything that happens. 
and wrestling, you're big over there. I mean, wrestling is big. Sumo wrestling, everything's sold out, sold out here. And, this, and our matches, most of them were sold out. And I mean, high price tickets to two and three hundred dollars for it. One time we was in the sumo pile, sold it out, and they had to. You got a box with four people, but you had to sit on your butt, you know, for, it was three hundred dollars a ticket. You know, it's just. I don't know how it is now, you know, they, they've had inflation got them and they've, they've been in a lot of trouble financially. But before, man, you go out and eat supper, it costs you fifty, sixty dollars. Mm -hmm. There's nothing cheap over in Japan. Nothing in Japan is cheaper than here. Yeah. Did you have a problem with the food? I know a lot of people say that they go over there. No, and... I tell you, I eat good food. I tried something different every night. Yeah. I, uh, they got good food. I mean, but I tried, I, I ate something different every every night. They had different stuff that you cook, and we'd go out and eat. And, and, uh, they got a lot of, I mean, after a while, you, you wish for some American food, or, you know, but, you know, they had a McDonald's there then, and mm -hmm. we'd go down and get a McDonald's. And, uh, Japan, it's, it's a big place. What promoters did you work for in Japan? Baba and and Anoka. You were for both of them. And how was the pay compared to the the U.S. at that time? Was it? Oh, you make good money over there. I, I wouldn't go for a long time because they didn't want to pay you. When I first started wanting to go to Japan, they were going. I think they paid them guys four or five hundred dollars a week. And anyway, that was big pay then. I, I wouldn't go for about ten years. I wouldn't go. They call me, call me. The first trip I went over, I got five thousand a week. But you take some of them guys like Stan Hansen, god damn, he was making 15 grand a week. You know, uh, Road Warriors are making about seven, eight grand a week. So, you know, it's, believe me, they make enough money to pay you that they wouldn't have you there. Mm -hmm. And selling stuff, you know, they sold your stuff. And, <laughs> and people bought that stuff like, you know, as fast as they could buy it. And, I mean, you're talking about big places they wrestled at. I know I wrestled Butcher over in, in Sapporo. How we did three hundred fifty thousand dollar house. And, uh, but uh, I, I think I was I, five thousand, and I made nearly every time I went. I, I, but I held off for a long time, and then finally the wages kind of went up, and then. I had fun there, but it's, it was one of them places that used to have eight-week tours, and then the guys got to just leaving, you know, because it just got, it's, I mean, it's great, but you're isolated, you know. The Japanese people don't like you. They treat you nice, but they don't like you. And uh, you have guys over here, you know, Japanese boys that were over here, take care of them, and, you know, take them out and, you know, treat them good. If they can get to Japan, they wouldn't even already know you. And, uh, so they cut the tours to four and then to three, then to two and a half, two weeks. About two weeks is about all them guys are taking. Plus they take your passport when you got there. That way you had a hard time. They took your passport. Who was, who, who was, who's they? The office. Okay. Well, why did they do that? So you wouldn't leave on them. Oh. <laughs> so I got left on them, you know. Right. So they take your passport and your ticket, and you couldn't go anywhere. Of course, for two weeks it's easy. Yeah, it's easy. Like, you just get going, and then it's time to come home. But eight weeks, <laughs> tough. Mm -hmm. But hey, I had a good time. I had a sponsor over there, the guys would come get you, take you out, get you laid, get you some, you know, take you to supper, uh, you, you know, pretty good friends, and I still talk to some of them. Yeah. And if you want to buy something, you know, they'll take you to certain places and get a good deal. And things are high, over high. Shirt like this, golf shirt, 100 bucks. Wow. I'm telling you, man. One night, I went, Tara and I went out to eat. Went to a shushi place. And, you know, and a hotel's nice. 
and we drank some beers and uh, 26 ounce beers. Well, we had sushi and and uh, he said, "Man, we ought to do this more often." They brought the thing forty thousand yen, hundred and sixty dollars. <laughs> I said, "I think this once a week will be alright on this." But you know, it just when you got the other money, it just doesn't seem the same. Mm -hmm. But Japan, uh, it's funny too. You never see any ragged people. Everybody's dressed nice. You don't see any bums. You don't see any. You know, and when you go out in the farming areas, you'll see farmers, and, and that's about it. Hmm. <clears throat> the, I, I don't know if I, did you say Jesse Venture? Is that who you were talking about? When? When, when you were talking about sharing a beer in Japan. Did you say Venture? I, I missed the name. Uh, uh, Patera. Patera, okay. Because I was going to ask you what, what you thought about Jesse Venture and the, and the politics. Well, I know Jesse. Well, yeah. I wrestled Jesse a bunch in, yeah. when I was in AWA. Jesse's a smart man. You know, he used to uh, have his political parties, you know, or help them guys. Like they have a fish fry or something, we'd catch fish for him. Mm -hmm. And he would he was starting to dabble a little bit then and like you know, he was a mayor of his his hometown there, a little big town in Minnesota. I mean little, not probably a thousand people. So he was like the, he had a gym and he became the mayor. But just he's a smart man. You know, you know how he got in that uh, uh, what's his name? That movie he was in the uh, the Predator movie. The Predator. Mm -hmm. He found out Schwarzenegger was working out at this gym like four in the morning. So he got the guy to give him a key, and he went down there and started working out. He worked out a couple of times and didn't even say anything. You know, they didn't speak. Finally, they spoke and started talking back and forth. He ended up getting in the movie. And that's how he got in that movie. That's what made him start, you know, mm -hmm. got him to be a big name. But I tell you, he, he must, he did a good job because he beat one of the toughest guys, you know, Hubert Humphreys Jr. You know, his dad's a legend there. Mm -hmm. But the people are ready for a change. They want a change in politics, man. I wouldn't surprise me if that woman ran for president she didn't win. You know, they're tired, they're so damn tired of, you know, the stuff that they're getting. Mm -hmm. And they want to change up there. And the people said, well, what do you think will happen if he gets this question asked, that question asked? They said, well, he can't do any worse than the ones they've had. And yeah. that's the way I look at it. And I think, you know, Jesse's not a dummy. They think just because he wrestles, he's a dummy. Well, he's not a dummy. Mm -hmm. And I think he'll do good. So you could tell back then that he, he was ready to dab into politics. Oh, he was dabbling a little bit, you know, helping guys mm -hmm. that get elected, and he was, you know, uh, having a fish fries for them, and, you know, and I said, man, you watch him end up to be a state senator one day. I'm <laughs> sure he ends up being a pro governor. He did. Um, <clears throat> you know, back in the early 70s, I think it was in St. Louis, you had some... Uh, some uh, matches with Nick Bockwinkel and Ray Stevens we did some tag work there. What were some memories of those times? Well, they were two of the best wrestlers, some of the best wrestlers I ever wrestled. They were great. Ray Stevens was a super wrestler. And Bockwinkel too. Um, I used to be here and I would go to St. Louis from here, you know. And, uh, I wrestled Flair out there. I wrestled Kamala, Bachwinkle, Stevens, Bruiser, uh, God, a lot of them, you know. They usually drew, they usually drew up, you know, good house and got a good pay. Mm -hmm. You go out there for one day and then come back the next day. But I wrestled Bachwinkle and Stevens in Minnesota when I was there, you know, they were the champions. The Crusher and I won the belts one year. We were the champions there for about you know, six months. And I wrestled Bachwinkle in St. Paul one night. We had we sold it out, did two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. And uh, I left and went I forget where I was, I went somewhere in Florida or somewhere. But uh, you know, I just stayed like I stayed three years once and three years again and this last time I stayed three years, almost three years.
I like Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So I love to fish and hunt. And boy, there's a lot of fish and a lot of hunting up there. Mm -hmm. And one time I got on TV up there, you know, I said, man, I like to hunt and fish. I had letters come in there, man. I had all kind of hunting and fishing. North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, and you know, they got a, they had a good coverage on their TV up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they kind of had a lock on it. And then when New York, you know, WWF came in there, they really hurt them because New York took a lot of their guys and it hurt Vernon and them a lot, you know, because they had, well, he had Hogan and Hogan wanted to go nationwide you know, burn, oh no, 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 well, he should have said yes, yeah. because look what he did, he, so he went to New York, New York. look at the TV and away they went. Okay, so you were there at the same time Hogan was? When, what are your impressions of him? When I was there, Hogan was on the second match. He was a big, tall guy, we had a Fu Manchu, his name was Terry Boulay, he was a bad guy, he just he couldn't wrestle, mm -hmm. you know. But he, had, you know, he had matches, and then he got that deal with Stallone, you know. Rocky won, I guess. Mm -hmm. So he went out there and made that movie. And when he come back, he was all Hogan. Sold out everywhere we went. Well, I went back up there about, I guess, about two years later. And you know, when I was there before, Billy Graham and I set all the records. You know, we were selling out everywhere. So I, the first night I was there, I was on. Second match. Mm -hmm. So I, I went and I told Vern, I said, hey man, I set all the records here, now you got me on the second match. But when you'd come in, that, you'd be on the second match, and then the next week you'd be on the third match. So that week I worked on the second match all week, right? And Hogan was on top, and we're still on the house. I got my check, $4,000. I said, I said, just leave me on the second <laughs> match. <laughs> but, you know, he was hot when he came back. Yeah. And, uh, same with Jesse when he made that movie, he got hot. But that movie, you know, made uh, Hogan was hot, and that black boy played Mr. T. Mm -hmm. He got hot, you know. And you know, it's just if you make a movie, it just seems like that the people draws in a lot of extra. Pain. Yeah, it just yeah. seems to think they think, yeah, okay, he's a star, you know. But uh, Hogan did well. But then him and Vern, they were, they were, you know, where he turned Vern down. To, he didn't want to. He wanted to go nationwide, and Vern didn't. So. So it was really Hogan's idea to ask him to go nationwide. And yeah, he asked him. He said, "Man, let's go nationwide." We get. Vern said, "No, no, no, no. We have right here. We can't do this. And we can't step on this guy's toes." And so he went to Vince Junior. I mean, Vince Senior would have never done it. Mm -hmm. He was from the old school, but the boy, he don't care. So. He had NBC sitting over home, and you know, if you turn your TV on, you got NBC. Well, see, that's what happened to Crockett here. Dusty Rhodes convinced Crockett, okay? He said, Man, we need to run nationally, right? Well, first place, they didn't have any TV here. They had TV for North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, which was costing them, I don't know. Awesome, but I'd say probably four or five hundred thousand a month. So now they they're going to go nationwide, and Dusty talked them into it. Okay, now they go to New York. They got to pay eight thousand dollars a week for just one TV up there. Okay, all these places, they like, all these states where they want to run, they got to pay. They had about a four million dollar a month bill for TV. Vince McMahon gets eight hundred and seventy thousand for doing the taping on NBC. So they're at a disadvantage to start yeah, with. Yeah. Then they go up there and try to run in New York. Couldn't do it. Because it's WWF territory. Well, he killed him. Yeah. He run around there, and I mean, he just killed him. So then he started coming out a little bit, and uh, if he, if they had stayed right here and run North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. And uh, they could, they, we made $54 million in four, month, four years here. I mean, it was a good place, and we were selling out. We're doing a, on those tours, we're doing like 200000 we did in Fayetteville, and we did fifty, sixty thousand 60000 every Friday in Richmond. 
and 30 or 40 in uh, Hampton and 30 or 40 in Norfolk. And uh, Charlotte was selling out every week, 11,000 people. And we were, you know, uh, $100,000. Uh, Greenville selling out 30, 40. I mean, we're doing, we're good, we're on fire. And then they went to that trying to take over there. They didn't need it. And I'm telling you, then they bought a jet, and then they bought a turbo jet. And then you, I, I could tell when they were going, we were wrestling here, and used to wrestle there, and you get about 1800 bucks for the main event. So we kept selling out, selling out, selling out. And it went down, down, and one night, I got my check, $400. $400, I said, man, it's over. And about two or three weeks later, Turner bought him out because he liked Jimmy. He didn't have to buy him, he could have just took it. But he gave him 500 grand. He gave the girl, the mother, and everything 300 grand. And uh, took it. But it was a gold mine for him. Mm -hmm. Because he's the only guy that could have taken it over and had the facilities and stuff to make it go. You know, See, he had a hard time making it go, and he still is. Mm -hmm. But they're both doing big business. But he had the money and the, the you know the tools of the, with the station there and everything. But I just believe it would have been anybody else. They'd, they'd have been blistered out because New York is strong on NBC, and they still got higher ratings in uh, Turner. But uh, so you think if they wouldn't have attempted to go national, that, that things would have been okay? Just sticking around here in the southeast. Yeah. We had it made here. They, New York was trying to came into Richmond and we were selling out. Mm -hmm. 50, 60,000. They came in here and did about 10 grand, you know. They couldn't they couldn't crack it here. They kept coming in but they couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And then uh, then when they went up there, boy that opened the gates and, and but now New York comes here, they do good. Yeah. They they sold out the Coliseum last time. Yeah, they're out drawing WCW now in Charlotte. Yeah, they, they drew the Coliseum sellout. The Fedville, they sold out. Uh, I tell you, they, 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 they give them a lot of bullshit, but they give them some pretty good matches, too. And WCW, I'm telling you more, you get tired. Every time something comes up, there's four or five guys getting there and beat the other guy up. Referee never disqualifies anybody, never finds anybody, and never... <laughs> No, you know, you can't, can't do that. You got people you pay money to see who's the best, you know. I mean, you can put girls and cheerleaders, and but still the people want to see two guys get in there and see which one can put the other in the butt. That's just human nature. Yeah. Before uh, Turner took over, you had a, a pretty long run as a U.S. champion. And I know that you... Uh, for some reason, you never lost the title. They would take it away from you, or, or you'd, you'd get well, injured. Well, I lost the title to a magnum that time. Yeah, but th you had it three other times, I think, two or three other times. Mm -hmm. And then one time, there was something with, the, they said that Abdul the Butcher hurt you, and then you had to forfeit the title. And well, he, yeah, he hit me with a coat hanger, man. He sliced me pretty good. But, uh... I, I couldn't have, I was whacked out there for about a month. Then one time I won the world bill from Harley. I broke my ankle. Mm -hmm. Valentine fell on my damn ankle and broke it, and I had to get that belt. And I kept it two weeks. And, uh... So there were just legitimate injuries while you had to step out for a while? You seemed to have a lot of bad luck after you picked up a... Oh, anyway, I don't know. I told my like every time I win something, something bad happens. But, yeah, I took off 70 days. I went went home, went fishing. Relax, that's all I could do. Mm -hmm. Break your ankle, man, it's like, never heals. Yeah. Still bothers me. Now, you can do your arms or anything, your neck, well, you're fine, but boy, your ankle, it's, it's, I don't know, it's just not a lot of blood vessels in there. And injuries just healed so slow and so, you know, they don't heal good. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's just like I told Eagle, man. You better watch his, uh, his Achilles is bad, man. Being real bad. 
thing just snapped and pulled out of his leg, he'd be crippled for life. Well, what were your impressions of Magnum TA? Because that was a, a pretty distinct point where they, they seemed to be going in a new direction with the, the whole product. Well, a lot of young Magnum guys. was in a position where I think he would have made a lot of money in wrestling. He was big, tall, he was good looking. Um, him and Dusty were good friends, and I just think, you know, he was in a position, you know, and he was a good good talent, that he would have made a lot of money in wrestling if he hadn't got hurt. Yeah. But you never know, you know, stuff like that happened. Yeah. But he was on the verge of really breaking through, and, and he had that car wreck. Right. I saw him the other night, I was up there. He was in the dressing room, he kind of ran good, you know, he got a motorcycle, special three-wheeler he can ride, and he rides it. Uh, he's still about, I don't know, his right side is a little slow, but he's, he's lucky to walk. Yeah. I was up there the first, day, I think the third day he was there, and he was flat of his back, and he said, he'll never walk, he'll never be able to do anything from his head down. He he said, I'm going to walk, and he worked and worked and worked. I'd go up there, man, and he'd lift them weights, and, he, you know, he just, his right side was slow. And then he went to Miami at Bonacani Center, and they took that x-ray with him around and around and found the spur, and they went there and cut it off, and he got a little better. But he's got about 90% on his right side, you know. But it finished him as a real Yeah, as well. But he's lucky he could, he, he could have been killed. Mm -hmm. If he hadn't had a big strong neck on him, you know, that top came right down on him and had him broke his neck, he, he probably would have killed him. Mm -hmm. What are some of your memories about Starcade? Because it was the, the biggest event in wrestling at that time, and you were well, part of the first three or four there. Well, you know, I, it was just, it was like a big show, you know. They, they put together a star K, you know, and, and we used to do, I guess, what, two or three, what, didn't we have a star K in Charlotte, and mm -hmm. then in Greensboro, and then... That was, that was Great American Bash, was it? Oh, was it? Yeah. Man, I'll tell you, star I... Star K's, I think, originally were on the Thanksgiving night. Well, we did one here at star K, I remember, then, and then we did closed circuit in right. other places. Mm -hmm. um, then we did one in Greensboro and we had the closed circuit, you know. And, uh, uh, but I never paid a lot of attention to that. You know? Just another show? Yeah. Um, you know, I was a booker here for a while. What time period was that? Well, you know, it was kind of a shitty thing. It was, <laughs> it was Dory Funk and me and Ernie Ladd. So they gave me North Carolina, Ernie Ladd, South Carolina, and Funk was kind of Virginia, right? So, you know, naturally, my town, I want the best guys, right? And I'm trying to work in angles and stuff, and I'm trying to get the best guys that'll draw. And well, I'm sure, you know, Ernie Ladd was trying to do the same, and um, so they, uh, I said, man, I, I, I'm, I'm through. I can't do this. It wasn't going to work. So I quit. And I was supposed to get the job. Flair kept saying, don't worry, you're going to get it. Don't worry, they're going to get rid of it. They're going to give you the job. So I waited about two or three weeks. My phone rings one Sunday. It's Dusty. Dusty says, well, I'm the new booker here. He says, I just want to tell you, I really need you, and I need some, I might need help from you. I said, oh, okay. So that's when the downfall started right then. Mm -hmm. And then right after that, they started to try to go dusty blue smoke up their butt. And they were going to try to go nationwide, but they didn't have TV. They had to pay for all their TV. Or, you know, like I said, the guy in New York, he gets $750,000 a show. Yeah. Plus, 
he's on every C a TV set you turn it on. The NBC's there. So they were fighting a losing battle to start with, and they, and, I, and it didn't take them long. I'd say, what, five, six months, they were gone. And I wouldn't ever do any good. The business was good here, too. And uh, just Other than that thing, do you have any uh, stories or thoughts about Dusty Rhodes? You obviously disagreed with his decision to take it nationally. Well, I've known Dusty since he was 16, 17 years old. Uh, I always got along with Dusty pretty good. You know, he was, he was like me, he was bullheaded. He was Dusty or no way or no way. But I got along with him and, you know, I drew money with him. And I wrestled against him. Uh, him and Dick Murdoch a lot. And, but we always got along. He was pretty good. Some of his stuff, you know, I didn't agree with what he did, but, you know, he didn't matter about it, he's perfect. But he did a good job, and you know, people, in his places usually where he promoted. I went to Florida, he killed Florida, I mean, it was dead. Couldn't draw nothing. I spent three years there, man, we had that thing, doing $150,000 a week. But it took some time and stuff to repair all that. Because when he was there, you know, he just pushed you dusty, dusty, dusty. Mm -hmm. And when you go in, boy, it's, you know, it's tough. But I don't know what he does in for Turner. You know, he's around, but, you know, you never hear him say anything. So I, I don't think he's got too high a position with him. So I don't. So you don't talk to him much these days? I don't talk to anybody. You don't talk to anybody? A few of the old timers call, you know, every once in a while, and uh, Ricky Martin calls me. Um, you're out of sight, you're out of mind. Um, I went to the matches that night. I took my boy in the dressing room, going to introduce him to everybody, right? <laughs> there was 25 guys in there. I knew one guy, Lex Luke. <laughs> The rest of them are all Japanese and all Mexican. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I knew two Mexican boys because their dads used to work for them. They came over and said hi. And uh, he said, Dad, don't you know what they I said, I don't know these guys. <laughs> and they didn't know me either. So, you know, I said, well, I guess it's it's over. Then. And, uh, so this isn't a business where you make a lot of, you keep a lot of friends, I guess. Well, yeah, it just, when I was wrestling, I had a ball. I had good friends. I, we drank together, raised hell together, and partied. And, but uh, I met a lot of good guys in wrestling. You know, I still talk to some. Mm -hmm. Bachwinkle. Ray Stevens was my roommate, you know, and he died last year. Uh, I talked to Cart and Ronnie Garvin the other day. He lives over on the river. And uh, Red Bastine calls me about once every month. He's travels around and married a rich girl for about 20 million bucks. <laughs> wow. But I tell you, a lot of guys I used to wrestle were dead. I mean, a lot of them. Heart attack and dying. Not, they're not dying from old age. That's the only thing. They're all dying from something. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruiser Snyder is gone. Uh, Murdoch. Murdoch. Murdoch was young too. Uh, I'm telling you, a lot of them that I wrestled with over the years is gone. Malenko. Uh, I tell you, wrestling people are good do it right it's it's a hard business but it's you know it's something you're you know doing something you like I guess I mm -hmm. liked it I enjoyed it if I hadn't enjoyed it I, you know I'd have probably done something else you know yeah I think it was about a year or maybe a year and a half ago there was a lot of rumors on the internet about you know your poor health and, and uh, rumors of kidney problems well you know I lost my kidneys and I go to dialysis every week mm -hmm. three times a week 
but I'm hoping to get a kidney here. I got a donor, and uh, I've taken all the tests, you know, to make sure that when you get a new kidney, you have to be totally clean of no, no other diseases or, or anything bothering you. So I've taken all those tests. So I'm looking for a kidney in probably April. And uh, so far I've passed. I got one kidney biopsy, I mean liver biopsy I had. And it should be in and then man, I'm ready to get a kidney. Mm -hmm. it slows you down a little bit, I'll tell you that. How, how serious were your health problems a year ago? Because uh, they, they, they paid you as being on the verge of death there. I was at one time. You were? I went in the hospital, I weighed 340 pounds. I filled up with water. I was, I was, three days they put the shots in me. I went from 340 to 260. 80 pounds in two and a half days I lost. But my kidneys had quit and I didn't know it. Yeah, and I, that's why you were. I had all that poison in my system. And then I started doing dialysis and then that's a hard adjustment there, I'm going to tell you. And uh, you're in trouble if you don't like needles because <laughs> they'll stick you plumb full of holes down there. But uh, I've been working on a kidney. I'm hoping to get it. I'd hate to have to go down there to Dawson's. Some of the people have been there 15, 20 years. They don't even try to get a kidney. There's no way I would go and not try to get a kidney. I, uh, you know, if you get a kidney, you know, in a good one, it's, you got another 20 years. You just, the days that you dialysize, you're just kind of weak, you know. But I come home and take my pills and my vitamins, and by the next day, I go play golf all day. Yeah. I perk right back up. But they, say, if they take all the blood out of your system. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they put saline with it and they purifies it and they put it back in. You, you're up there at 7 in the morning, and 7.30, and 11.30, you're out and gone. Mm -hmm. Go eat lunch. I come home, eat lunch, and maybe take an hour nap. I'm up, I'm going. I mean, you know, it's it's a uh, you know, it's the only way you can live. So you you got to do it. Yeah. But uh, it's not that bad. It's. Well, I think you're looking pretty good right now. You know? Well, I feel good, nice. and I play in golf, and I'm walking and exercising, and. Uh, got to do a little something. Well, last year when I came out, I couldn't bend over to put the ball in the ground. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh my gosh, you know, I, I got, you know, I get dizzy. At the end of this, last summer, I was hitting up three buckets of balls a day. I went from, barely could hit a half a bucket. And, and I was walking, and uh, I, I, I was in good shape. If you stay, you know, a lot of them people there, they don't, they won't take care of themselves, and you can see them deteriorate when you go. You know, they, they drink a lot of fluid. You can't you can't drink a lot of fluid. You know, you can eat good, mm -hmm. but you can't drink a lot of fluid because it stays in your system. <laughs> them people, you, they won't listen, man. Some, some of them people are getting 30 pounds between in a day's time in fluids. Hoping they get a kidney in April. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna try the name game. Just you know, we'll mention some names, and if anything comes up, just just share it. Like Rick Flair, you've had countless matches with him. Yeah, I've, I've wrestled Flair a lot, and and I wrestle with him a lot too. You know where. He's a good athlete. You know, he stays in shape. And he's a credit to the business, you know. It's like when Turner sued him Christmas, you know. Two million he sued him. And I said, man, that's like suing Babe Ruth. <laughs> you know, because he's he's put a lot of time and a lot of effort in it. Wrestling wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a guy like him, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I don't know what his deal is down there. And I'm sure he's got a good deal. But he's like everybody else. When you get to be 50 years old, <laughs> it's time to go. Yeah. I mean, uh, the other programs are saying, <laughs> if you're not 40, you can't get a job there. Or, you know. <laughs> so they got, you know, you got to have new blood. And, and uh, they just need to get a, you know, they're going to have to clean house, you know. Hogan is old, old hat, uh, Flair is old hat. They're going to have to get some new blood, you know, and they're going to have to build a new stars. Because, you know, these guys have been up to New York, down to Atlanta, up to New York, back to and they're burnt out. And after a while, you can just make so many storylines, you got to have, you know, you know, they need a new young guy. Well, they got, uh, uh, what's that guy with the rock? Yeah. That's uh, Iakea's son, you know. Well, he's a new face, though, but he's, you know, he, he's somebody that the people, you know, know his dad was a great wrestler. And, you know, Turner, he got some cheerleaders and a bunch of girls on there. You know, where I, I think you, you, you know you need to find some new faces mm -hmm. to start pushing. And uh, secret to that, man, is you got your group main eventers, and then you got some guys you're bringing along, and you got another group bringing along. Same way with football, it's the same way with anything. You got two or three different groups that you're building. So if one guy gets hurt, another guy fills in. You never mean that's the same way in football. They have enough players where they got coming up. They're right sitting right there. They might be as good as the guy playing, but they're holding back, and then they let him go. Then you're, you know, the same way the rest. They got to have new faces because that TV man, you're on every, all over the United States now, and they get, to, you know, Flair's been there 25 years. He's lucky to be able to be, you know. A, When's the last time you talked to Flair? Probably about two or three weeks ago. I was down to Thunder here. Okay, so you saw him there. Yeah, well, you know, Flair and I are friends, but I don't call him every day or every month or every so and often. Yeah. Uh, it's just like Arn Anderson, you know. He's been here 20 years, right? I go to a golf tournament. He comes up to me and says, geez, why, why don't you call me and take that boat of yours and we'll go fishing? I said, all right, I still got the same phone number I've had for 20 years. You know, he went, uh, didn't even strike him, you know. He, he's never called me. He's never called me. Eaton's never called me. Uh, Flair's wife and my ex-wife were from high school together, grade school, and I was old. I knew everything had happened because they talked. My boy went, she'd take my boy out there and him and Reed would play. And then my boy Russell Reed in these tournaments we had for kids, you know. And uh, I'd see Flair every Sunday at the tournaments usually. Uh, so I didn't get along with Flair's wife. So I stayed away. And. Uh, He sent me a deal the other day to, for his 50th birthday to come to the country club. I didn't, I didn't, even, I didn't go. Didn't go. I mean, but Rick Flair's a good guy. I mean, it's just the wife's an asshole. <laughs> she always has been, will be. So. Now, was she before the, before the, uh, your ex-wife, or was that after your ex-wife that you didn't like Flair's? Oh, when we was married, I didn't like. Oh. We went out a lot, you know. We partied together, went to deals and everything. And just, she just got worse. <laughs> she's the world's champion's wife, right? She ain't Mrs. Flair. She's the world's champion's wife. She thinks she's she should be treated like him. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! And then her, my ex-wife, and her went. I mean, they were like that big together through high school. Yeah. And. Uh, and she ended up marrying Flair. But they don't get along at all, man. <laughs> but she ain't giving up that big money. Well, Flair and his wife don't get along? She ain't, no. They don't even sleep together. And, uh, 
but she's not giving up that life. You can't blame her. <laughs> no, I don't blame her either. I mean, she's got a good life. And, uh, he's gone all the time. Yeah. <clears throat> Something just popped in my mind is that I know a lot of the uh, boys, they had wives back home, but they'd have girlfriends in other towns and stuff. Uh, they did. <laughs> <laughs> Of course not you, but everybody else. Yeah, there was a lot of girls that hung around the matches. Uh, you know, but it's no different than any other sport. Right. The same way in football. I mean, they didn't hang so much around the football field, but they knew where you went and drank. And so they always hung in the bars where you were there. Uh, um, they'll find out where you, you know, where you go and drink, hang around, and they'll come there. But every sport has. So it's just as bad in football as it was. It's just bad football and baseball players. They're the yeah. same and same with hockey. The same with the wrestling. You know, it's just you have there your fans and yeah. so it's. Uh, <laughs> I was married five times, so you know I had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> well, back to the name game. Uh, what about Mandy Fernandez? Well, I'll tell you about Manny. Manny is a good talent, an excellent talent in the ring. But he is a troublemaker as so much I ever met in my life out of the ring. He, um, he just one of them guys that just can't stay out of trouble. He's got a temper. So he, one time he came to me and I, he didn't have a place to live. I had an apartment. I said, okay, you can move in here. But he said, you ain't staying longer than two weeks. First week he was there, the police were there six times <laughs> knocking on my door looking for him. Yeah. Stuff he did, like he ran into somebody on purpose and wrecked him and they got the tag number and they got him. Uh, he beat the heck out of somebody and he did something else. But there, I think six or seven times in that first week, I told him, I said, man, you got to go. Now, he wouldn't move his stuff. So I put all his stuff out on the front porch and shut the door. And he finally left. I mean, I like Manny, don't get me wrong. But he's, you got to doubt everything he says. But in the ring, he, he's a good talent. It's just a waste of talent is what it is. Cause he, he, he could go to WCW and do good there if they'd push him. But if you're going to push a guy and you never know whether he's going to be available, you know, it just hurts you sometimes. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but, man, you're in the ring. You're going you're gonna to have good matches with him. You're going to have to wrestle your ass off because he's a good wrestler. And he'll, He'll test you. Yeah. What was the story we were talking about? Uh, when he called, when he was staying with you, he was telling us one night in the dressing room that he called you and said, well, I'll just come up there and whoop your old ass. And you were like, well, come on up here. Yeah, I told him, I said, you come right on up here. I'll give you something. <laughs> yeah, man. I, when I first started wrestling, man, he was young. I wrestled him one night, and God damn, he was laying on his ass. He couldn't get up, out of shape. I said, man, you need to get your fat ass in shape. And man, after that, you know, he started working out every day, set up step ups and doing all that. Then he got in shape. He said, man, I appreciate you helping me. But you know, <laughs> he was laying on his butt, man. I told him, I said, get off of your ass, boy. He couldn't even move. <sighs> but now he's in good shape, you know. He stays in pretty damn good shape now. The thing I remember about Manny was Conway, South Carolina. I wrestled Manny there, and I was a good guy. Sold out. Two months later, we came back. I wrestled there. I wrestled Manny. I'm the bad guy, and he's the good guy. Sold out again. And funny, remember my idea was? Yeah, sold it out twice. One's a good guy, and one's a bad guy. <laughs> uh. How about Dick Murdoch? Dick Murdoch was a character. I 
and don't date mark on it. Since 1964, we're wrestling in uh, Texas. Uh, God, what was the name of the town? A little town north of Amarillo. And his dad was a promoter. Frankie Murnau. And that night we were wrestling, we had a bear, we had a big bear, you know, a 400 pound bear, and they had a little bear there. It was about 200 pounds. So we're wrestling, and then at the end we all have a battle royal, you know, they, they put chicken wire fence around there, put the bear in there, and you'd jump, and you know. But, the, but I mean, it drew like crazy, because they only did it like once a year. So. I'm standing outside there, and they got this other bear chained up too, you know. And this kid, this bonded kid, tall, is messing with that bear. I said, "Kid, you better leave that bear alone." I said, "Someone's gonna bite you." He said, "God damn it! I can do anything I want to. My dad's a promoter." <laughs> that was Murdoch. That's the first time I ever met Murdoch. I said, I said "What an honorary little fucker that is!" And. Uh, <laughs> So it was about 10 minutes, I heard, yeah, <laughs> that bear bit him through the thing. <laughs> and that was my first time I met Murdoch. I think he was 11 years old. Wow. And I've been good friends with him ever since, I'm telling him. He was, he loved to drink his beer. Uh, you couldn't, you couldn't blow him up in the ring. He looked like shit, a big old belly, tall, and big old belly, but I'm telling you, you could not blow him up in the ring. I, one eye is wrestling. Sioux City, Iowa, uh, the Corn Palace out there. Uh, let's see, Sioux City, Sioux City, Sioux City, South Dakota. The Corn Palace there. I'm wrestling. I <laughs> saw so I grabbed him and arm dragged him. He said, again, again, again. I arm dragged him about ten times and I was about to faint. <laughs> He's laughing. He could not blow him up, man. Could not make him draw a deep more He was uh, he was a good, but he didn't look like in shape. He looked like an old farmer, mm -hmm. but he was a good talent, and uh, he had a good time. He was crazy, wild, say anything, you know, everything he wanted to say. say it. I hate to see Dickie. He died young. That's a shame. Was anyone that was more shocking? You see, pass away than Dick Murdoch. Dick was pretty outspoken for all of them, you know. He he was kind of like me. He didn't take any shit. He wanted his money, and he'd tell you. If he'd like something, he'd tell you. And there's not a lot of guys like that, you know. A lot of guys, but he, you know, he would he would tell you. I we used to wrestle him and Dusty a lot. Dirty Dick Murdoch and Dirty Dusty Rhodes. And well, well, they were in AWA there for a while. We wrestled. I wrestled Dick a lot over the years. You know, mm -hmm. starting from when I first started in Amarillo. You know, later on he started wrestling. He started wrestling pretty early too. Probably the last time you wrestled him was out at the Slam Marine. I wrestled him there at the retirement thing. Okay. Uh, they had a match and they put it in black and white like the old days. And well, yeah, we wrestled him. Uh, I'd like to have a tape of that. I may call in and see if I can get a tape. Hmm. <laughs> I call and say, who? <laughs> oh God! Well, I just say you, you need to enjoy it while you go, and have a good time. And if you don't like it, don't do it. I had a good time. I made money. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying life now. Mm -hmm. I got a little, you know, my ten-year-old boy. I play golf every day and. I'm going to fish. I'm going to start back fishing. I was fishing tournaments, you know. So I'm going to start back fishing. And I 
I guess. I don't be too old to do anything. I'll just die. <laughs> How about Bruiser Brody? Bruiser Brody uh, was, you know, he, when he first started wrestling, he was a lot bigger than he was. He had big, huge legs on him. I mean, he was like 300 and some odd pounds, you know. And uh, so one night I'm in San Antonio. They bring him in, Bruiser Brody. And he said, man, this guy's rugged. So we started wrestling. He was rugged, but he wasn't in good shape, you know. And boy, he was huffing and puffing. Of course, he was huge then, you know. He, he had like thighs, you know. Later on, he trimmed down, his body thinned down. And I went to throw him out of the ring, and he, he was so green that he, he, he went through the rope, and the rope cut his neck and him. He cut his arm, you know, like that. You know that tape does you. And uh, God, after that match, it looked like I'd taken you'd taken a hose and beat him. And that guy looked at me and said, "God, I can tell you wrestled well." <laughs> but <laughs> he would just, you know, I think this was about his second or third week to wrestle. He said, yes, sir, Mr. McDaniel. No, sir, Mr. McDaniel. You know. But then he became he became a big star in his business, especially in Japan. Oh, he did well over there. Well, he did well here. He Puerto Rico, and uh, yeah, that's where he got killed. Over there in Puerto Rico. But Bruiser Brody, man, he was he was a, a thick, thick, big, and then he thin, you know, he thinned his body down, and, and uh, but he 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 did good enough. Do a lot of big houses. I was going to ask you, uh, I mean, you, you were most famous for the strap matches. What, did you come up with that idea? Because I, I can't really remember of any other strap matches. Before. No, they used to have Indian strap matches a long time ago. Just, just we made them a little more exciting, I think, than what they used to have. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to wrestle a strap match. Because just so many things you can do, and, and it's not, you know. To make it different. Maybe. Yeah, so you have to. But the guy can't get away from me, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm trying to think who that was. A mulligan one time I got strapped to. It's almost like to beat me to death. <laughs> I couldn't drag him. He weighed 312 pounds. I couldn't drag him, and I tried. And we was wrestling in the stadium out here, you know. And, well, we were fighting like a dogs, man. We had, we had about it was about a twenty thousand dollar house, you know, and you're usually doing three thousand in Park Center where well, we did seventeen, eighteen thousand. It was packed and we're in there fighting in front of us. I said, God dang, I can't drag him, man. So I scooted out of the ring. And he came out behind me and the guy went boom, hit me right in the back of the head, right? I turned around and here's a guy standing there with overalls on like this. <laughs> <laughs> I told Mulligan, I just move over by that foot. <laughs> I hit that guy right, right as hard as I could hit him, man. You talk about it. He went down like he got a hit with a wide old five outer. <laughs> then we went back and I drug Mulligan around three times, four times. And I was hot, man. That guy drilled me, boy. Yeah, that was our first outdoor show we had here at the Memorial Stadium. It's funny because today, you know, if, if you were to touch a fan and stuff, it's a, it's a big old lawsuit and stuff. But I think back in the day, yeah, before you know, nothing now. You, they're just looking, yeah, to get a lawsuit. And, uh, there's certain situations, you know, it's like that. You can, if they come in the ring, they're they're fair game. Mm -hmm. I know one night when I was in, I was working, I was wrestling in Greensboro, and I was. When I was a bad guy, and I was down the ring making an interview or doing something, and Flair came down and but we got into it, and I slammed his ass, and grabbed my belt, and I started out of the ring, and God, take the people, you know, zonked me, had me down between that railing, man. They were stomping, sit on me, man. 
I picked that belt up and I came up there and I, and I guarantee you, man, about six, eight people I nailed. Boom, bang, bing, bang. They were strode everywhere. And I went back to that dressing room and I said, my God, I said, I'll have a hundred lost. <laughs> you know, people are laying everywhere. I mean, I, I was fighting for my life, man. They had me down stomping this. And I got back to that dressing room. <laughs> I was sick, man. I came home and I said, oh, God. You know, I didn't get one lawsuit out of that. And I, I waffle, I waffle some of them people hard, dude. There'll be some goofball come along, you don't do anything. Well, he stepped on my toe or something, you know. Yeah. There was a lot of, a lot of lawsuits I got were like nothing. But it's the time of getting the lawyer to show up to do it. And I had a lot of law, I probably had as more lawsuits than any guy around. Because yeah. I, was, I wasn't a hothead, but I didn't like people putting their hands on me. And they'd burn you, grab your feathers, you know, they, they cannot, Resist jerking your feathers. And them kids that jerk your feathers, you know, those feathers cost a lot of money. Yeah. And they're not, they're brittle. And uh, I dinged on a bunch over that. And, you know, there was a lot of nuisance suits. But, you know, some people, it wasn't like today, man. You can you hit anybody, and you can't do anything to anybody that I'm going to Because there ain't no athletes make a lot of money now. It's different. <coughs> I want to touch on uh, the story. You went back to the W. You originally wrestled for Vince Senior. You were saying back in the in '63 and '4. And, and you never went back to the WWF until that that time I was on TV. Yeah, talk about how that came about. Well, I was playing football in New York for New York Jets, mm -hmm. and I well Kaniski was there, and Bruno, and Bobo, and a lot of guys I knew, and so they, you know, they had, you know, Vince asked me if I wanted to wrestle there, and I said, sure. And uh, so I stayed up there one year, between football and, and the next season I lived in Long, Long Beach. And uh, I wrestled uh, for uh, six months there. Mm -hmm. It was hard, you know. It was, my family's in Long Beach, Long Island there. And if I had to go anywhere, I had to leave by like 2 o'clock to get out through the, two t the Midtown Tunnel and the Lincoln Tunnel to get out of New York. Or hell, you'd be stuck there for the rest of the duration. And, uh, you know, he, he travels hard up there because there's so much traffic. And it takes so long to get out of New York City and cause everything's high. You know, the hotels are high. And the, Drinks and uh, everything, everything you did is high there, so you got to make good money. But I wrestled one season up there, yeah. I had Bruno for a partner a lot. And, uh, I wrestled with Bill Watts, Kaniski. Uh, I, I wrestled just about all of them. Yeah. But, you know, we, we drew good money and they paid you good. Yeah, but you didn't, you know, it's, it's hard to travel up there. There's always people where you go, people, people. What about when you went back for uh, Vince Jr., when you went back to do the angle with Tatanka? Well, uh, they called me and uh, asked me if I could come up there and we you know, were going to do a thing. I said, fine. But uh, I believe it's J.J. Dillon called me. I know J.J. better. Um, so I went up there and we had the feathers and we gave him time and did the thing. And so all them guys were saying, ask him, tell him you want to come here and wrestle, tell him you want to come here and wrestle. And I said, well, if he wants me to come here and wrestle, he'll ask me, you know. And so I, he never did, so I never pushed the issue. Because, you know, I was working anyway, so. It was just, that was just a one-time deal and then? He gave me, paid my way up there and gave me $700. Mm -hmm. And back the next day, I would be dumb to not do it. <laughs> and plus it took me out to eat. So you were also uh, 
after Flair was in his plane wreck, weren't you the first one to start having matches again with Flair after his wreck? Yeah. Uh, you know, his weight went way down. You know, he lost from what, 240 to about 190 pounds. He, he, was in, he was in bad shape there for a while. But I know um, one night I, I wrestled him and uh, he had the, uh, oh, I don't know what it was, his gallbladder went out. I think, yeah, it was his gallbladder. And we had a main event in uh, Norfolk. <laughs> Sold out. Now he, he's got a gallbladder. He's got to go to the hospital the next day, right? And get his gallbladder out. So he wasn't going to go. Here we got off. Sold out past forty thousand dollar fifty. I forget what. So we went up there and wrestled. He went and he didn't take his stuff because he wasn't going to wrestle. He's going to show up and say. So I got to talking to him. I talked to him into getting the ring. I remember it was a cage match. And uh, he wore some stuff out there. It looked like a shirt, but. We got the match over, and you know we didn't. The people didn't, you know, got their money's worth. So at least we saved the house, mm -hmm. saved their payday. Next day he went in. They went in there, you know, through his muscles and took it out. And, and on two weeks, two or three weeks later, he wrestled again. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, he came back pretty quick. He had a cyst cut off his back one time. He wrestled, did, was off a week, was off on that. He's tough. He works out. Well, he stays in shape. That's the secret. Mm -hmm. As long as you stay in shape, you can keep going. But once you start to get out of shape, you can forget it. So who were the toughest guys that you ran into? <sighs> well, it's hard to say. I could say ten top, ten guys, Valentine, John Valentine, mm -hmm. um, Killer Kowalski, Kaniski, um, Jack Briscoe, Harley, Mulligan. Mm -hmm. Slaughter, Piper's tough. I don't realize how tough he was. But you know, they're all those guys were all all you can handle. I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I wrestled them. Uh, Buckwheel and Stevens, are two great wrestlers together. You know, and. Um, and um, Some great wrestlers in those days when I was coming up. It was, but, uh, uh, it's just hard to say one tough one, you yeah. know, because a lot of them were tough. You have any favorite matches or any favorite angles that you're involved with? Well, Billy Graham and I had a strap match in Chicago when they did that movie, The Wrestler. Mm -hmm. was, I can't remember the heck of a match. Uh, I had a chain match with Malenko in Houston one time. It was the first sellout they ever had there. Uh, I wrestled Butcher in uh, Toronto right after that time. He zapped me with a coat hanger. We did about $80,000 getting up there and packed it. Just... People don't realize we used to wrestle 
eight, ten times a week when I was going on. You did TV a couple of nights. You did you wrestled two or three times on TV sometimes. Then you'd wrestle twice on Sunday. I mean, we didn't all do it, but if you was on the main event, they had to have an extra. We'd go to Asheville and wrestle, and then get in the plane and fly to Greensboro or fly to Richmond and wrestle again that night. You know, if you're getting paid. So you don't mind getting two pays in one day. I remember one night we wrestled here in the afternoon. Flew to Toronto and wrestled that night. Sold out here and sold out Toronto. And I think that's what influenced them to go nationwide. That was their downfall. What did you think about some of the uh, guys like Lex Luger? That you, you were kind of on your way out. They were kind of on well, way. you know, I was in Florida doing the booking and wrestling. Mm -hmm. We trained Luger down there. He was there. So we trained him. And uh, he, uh, he had a super body. You know, he's 6'5", and trim. And so... Uh, I booked him one time to wrestle in Coco Samoa, this little down in Hawaii. Well, they didn't get along. Well, I didn't know that. And boom, boom, and Samoa hit him. He hit him and cut his cheek, Luger's cheek. Luger ran out that door, grabbed a cab, and went to the hospital. Now, a plastic surgeon saw him out. He said, I'm not giving my looks or my everything. I said, well, okay. <laughs> and then the next time I saw Luger, he was he was in uh, WCW. He's a good kid. He's he, he's made as well, but he's wrestling on just not the greatest, but it's passable. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he's 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 always been nice. And, we, we trained him in Florida. And he didn't even, he didn't know a headlock from a toe lock either. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he's done well. He's made he's a lot of money. Well. Yeah. He turned out eight hundred grand to go to New York. That was stupid though. You think it was a mistake for him to go to the WWF? Yeah, yeah. He mm -hmm. didn't make nowhere near eight hundred dollars a year and thousand up there. Guaranteed eight hundred thousand there, guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And he went to New York, thought he was gonna do better. He didn't stay long though. New York's like a one, one guy deal. It's always been that way. There's uh, Bruno San Martino, and then there was who was that Mexican boy or Puerto Rican they had? Pedro Morales. Pedro Morales. And then there was, who was after him? Uh, Bob Backlund. Backlund. But it was all built around one guy, you know, up there. Then Hogan came. It was Hogan, Hogan, Hogan. And uh, at least they got, WCW's got more than one they're pushing. Mm -hmm. But I think New York gives them a better program than, than Turner. Shame they couldn't have somebody down there. That, I think the cussing's gonna kill them both, though. They're not careful. Because people before they didn't say much, but lately when I'm signing autographs, you know they they're thinking I'm him to I know everything, but I don't know any more than they do, you know. Mm -hmm. But they ask me, you know, well, how are they cussing? And I can't want my kid to watch it, and that upsets them. You know, something's got to happen, you know. So I don't. They're getting worse and worse, you know what I'm saying? There's nothing they don't say anymore. So you, you've been to, you did a lot of booking too. You were saying that you had the North Carolina Territory and that you worked out in Florida. I was in Florida. I, was booking, I, did the, I was a booker up in AWA mm -hmm. twice. And I had I went to San Antonio for three years and we Joe Blanchard and I 
broke off from Fritz down there and did her own thing. We mm -hmm. kicked his butt. <laughs> but we had we did good. Yeah. Well, he had Dallas, Fort Worth, and Devon, that was it. And we had the rest of it, Waco and we had Houston, the guy in Houston went with us, we had Corpus, uh, all the valley there, uh, Victoria. We did good. We had uh, some good Mexican wrestlers. We had at San Antonio, we had that Mexican station. Mm -hmm. It was strictly Spanish. And we had a show, when they did a show, we had a wrestling show, they had two Mexican announcers here two American announcers here. You'd do the tape and they'd have one in American would have one in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And you had 870,000 Mexican people there. And so we put some Mexican boys on the car to get them good wrestlers. And we packed them, man. We did well. What about some of those old, older uh, Mexicans like Santo and uh, Bill Mascaris? Gosh. Well, Odds and Masters and I were partners a lot. Mm -hmm. In those towns down there. Uh, I was a. Uh, I even wrestled with. Uh, the same. What was his name? The old. Wore a white mask. Is this El Santo? El Santo. Mm -hmm. I heard about him all those years, never seen him. We're in Dallas. I'm wrestling in Dallas, right? They said, well, tomorrow night you and El Santo are partners against Blackman and Gordonman and Goliath, you know. And I said, okay. So when I came in the dressing room, <laughs> you know, they're sitting on the bench and everything. I look in there and he's a little big guy, about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, maybe, and uh, 160 pounds, right? It looked like a little kid in there. That was El Santo. <laughs> now, here's a guy that's the biggest thing they ever had in Mexico. Movies he made, landing on the rich. Never nobody, nobody ever saw his face. And here he had it. So we go in the ring and he can't speak English. <laughs> I said, you stand here, okay? I, I tag you and you come fire, okay? So I went out there and they kicked the out of me. I tagged him and he came in and came in and and pow, bang, drop, kick, shit, go, people. <laughs> Boom, down, one, two, three, and the goddamn place. I mean, it was sold out. You couldn't get, people were standing outside to get in. People carried him down the aisle on their shoulders. <laughs> Here I'm laying him in the ring. I said, God damn. I said, well, but hey, we got a good payday. But I'm telling you, when he would come, the Mexican people, man, would come out of the woodworks. And that mastress came, and he had movies, you know, from Mexico. He was making movies and everything. He was a, a big movie star there, too. And all them towns where he'd come, uh, I'd be his partner most of the time, and we'd go out there. But he was, my Masters was a pretty good wrestler. Plus, he spoke good That's English, too. Sure. And he was a high-class guy. And um, I remember one time we're in Houston. He said, well, who, I want to go out tonight at really good places, you know, nice places. I said, okay. I said, well, what is stay? So we stayed at this hotel. I think it's about $75, but God damn, that was unheard of then, right? And then that night we went out to eat, and I think the tab was about $60, $70. And he says, uh, next time, please, uh, uh, not so high class, this. <laughs> <laughs> but he was he was a good, good guy, a good wrestler. draw a lot of people with him, I'll tell you, a lot. Were all these mask guys very protective of their identities or something in the back would they well, take their heads off? He was pretty protective. Uh, what was funny, he was a handsome guy, you know. He was a good looking guy. and had that mask and again, he would ease it off every once in a while working around people they didn't know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he was a handsome guy. But he was a high class guy, and he was, you know, he uh, he drew well, and he was stand up too. He, mm -hmm. You know, he'd argue for your money. But we had a lot of matches together you know, in, in Texas there.
you ever happen to see uh, groups like ECW? I watched them. Yeah. You watch them. What do you What do you think about that kind of style today? Well, there's no way humanly possible that you can last. Yeah. I talked to Funk. Funk told me he he was in bed. He, when they had that garbage can, I mean that garbage dump thing with the big thing. Oh, the WrestleMania. It hit him. His back hit the back of him. And he says, I'm, "I'm crippled." He said, I, "I don't think I'm ever going to be able to wrestle again." You know, he just came jumping off the second balcony. He said, "I don't give a shit how good acrobat you are. It's going to take a toll on you." And all them guys are beat to pieces. They can't hardly move around. You know, he just the human body. The body's just not going to take that kind of punishment. Them guys might go for a while. But, you know, Ray Stevens, he was one of the biggest bump. He took all the bumps, he took them the right way and everything. At the end, he couldn't hardly really walk. Yeah. And, you know, he never took any goofy bumps. He took the right way he learned and he did it. But he just, at the end, he couldn't even want to walk. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just can't take any bumps. Unless he being a big guy, you can't do it. He just had to beat you to death. But does it upset you? I mean, wrestling like in a more traditional style to see some of the younger guys go out and... Man, I don't care. I don't hope care. they make all the money in the world. I hope they get all the things they want. Hey, I'm happy. I had a good career. And I, I'm not sorry, Grace. No. Yeah. You know, I... Uh, you know, I just wish I could still do it, but I can't. So, but I'm having a good time. You know, I'm, i got my boy and... I spend a lot of time with him, and mm -hmm. you know I go sign autographs on the weekends. And, you know I know I'm, I hope they make all the money in the world. And, you know, glad it's coming this way. I'm glad the football. I'm glad they're finally getting some of the money like they're due. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm winning football now. They're starting to get money. They, you know, like when I played football, you didn't make anything. starting to make money now. So. so what do you think ended up being tougher on your body, the football career or the, or the wrestling? The wrestling was tougher. Mm -hmm. Football, I never got hurt. I played seven years. Well, I broke my hand once the first year and then I I played seven years and never missed a game. Then I tore a hamstring and then I tore more growing and just when you get older, I mean, you know, it's just when you say older, I'm talking like 28 years old. Mm -hmm. you, you lose a step of speed, you can tell it, and you kind of compensate, you know, you just, it's a young man's game, you know, and you, if you can last, well, the average life of a football player is three years, I think, three and a half years. And, you know, if a guy can last eight or nine, ten years, you know, he's done a pretty good job there because you guys are big anymore, and that field is like that right there. AstroTurf just eating their lunch. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the linebacker is 6'5 now, 270. <laughs> you know, and running 9, what, 4, 5, 40. It's just it's hard to believe, you know, that's, that you can last as long as you can. Well, do you have any other, you know, I don't a lot of stuff. Do you, do you have anything you want to say? Because there will be a lot of people from all the country. The tapes get traded and stuff. They'll probably see this thing and they've been fans of yours for years. Well, you know, that's about it. I, I know I did a lot of stuff in my day, but it's just hard to remember all of it on the spur of the moment. You know? Yeah. Uh, I wrestled all over, you know, and I think I wrestled every territory in the United States, and except for I didn't wrestle out in uh, Seattle out there. I wrestled in California, but I didn't wrestle for that office. I just went through a couple of times and wrestled Roy Shires, and uh, I wrestled, you know, in Puerto Rico. When I was in Florida, we we ran Puerto Rico once a month, and we ran Nassau in Freeport twice a month. Mm -hmm. 
It's, it's wild over there, believe me. It's, so you think Puerto Rico is more, I mean, distinctively crazier than any other place? Yep, and Nassau and Freeport, yeah, they, uh, it's hard on those guys. They throw stuff, and, you know, people don't, they're bad down there. And, uh, well, in San Domingo one time, they, uh, Flair wrestled some guy was the champion of the, you know, the big champ down there. And he took Piper with him as a second. So during the match, Piper grabbed the guy's leg, and down he went, and Flair pinned him. And people rioted, man. And I mean, they got the National Guard there with bayonets on. And finally, they got Flair and him into one of those, like, armored carriers, and got him out of there, and they, they, they had somebody get their clothes out of the dressing room and put it in there, and they took off, and they had to hide them. All night that night until the next morning, they finally took them to the airport in an armored carrier and put them on the plane. People, man, were trying to kill them. Piper told me, I'll never go back to that place. He's like, they got their life. I'm telling you, it takes a while down there. Did you ever have any similar experiences like that happen? Oh, yeah. One time we're wrestling. I'm wrestling Valentine in Corpus Christi, Texas. And, uh, no, it was, it was Mass Chris and me against Valentine and Killer Carl Cox. And we're going, and they got me down. They got Mass Chris down in the ring. And John went to put this leg breaker on. Boom, bounced him once, bounced him, he did twice. Mexican people came over and they started coming. And I looked at that ring and there was, there must have been 50 people in there. Just that quick, you know. And boy, <laughs> that Valentine and the cops me there knocking them guys out fast the they can hit them. And finally, <laughs> I got Masters and drug him out the side and we get out of there. After it's all over, you look out there and it looked like a bomb had hit, you know. People were laying everywhere and like this, and, and it's like silence in there, man. It's like a bomb had hit right in the middle of that ring. But uh, that was one ride, and then I was, I was in Greenville when the goalie got cut. And I got cut, he's, you know, he's cutting down through here and through his wrist with a pocket knife. And I was in uh, Richmond when Piper got uh, got knifed, and, and the guy knifed him right here. He was standing there watching the match, and the guy walked up and, and almost killed him. You know, he was lucky he didn't kill him, and he missed his heart. Uh, used to wrestle in Freeport and Nassau, and in Freeport was out in the open. We had an outside ring. And Man, they'd throw them rocks and stuff. We had a cage over the ring. That's you had to have a cage over the ring, or you couldn't get the you know. And we had a, an old van that you they'd take you down to the ring to the gate and let you in. They they they'd try to turn the truck over and throw rocks and you know it was it was, it was bad. Yeah. Man, but you know, I think we're selling out to eight ten thousand people. You know what are you gonna do? <laughs> but you go to Nassau and it was like an arena. Big high wall, like high as a ceiling. And uh, you'd wrestle. And there was some trees out there, and you'd look out there, and there'd be about 50, 60 guys in one of them damn trees. You know? So we saw the trees now <laughs> where they couldn't look over the fence. And then at the end of the matches, the minute the matches were over, here comes all these bricks and rocks coming in there. Every time, you know, and they, they kill the spectators. But man, I used to. As soon as the match over, I'd dive out and get me a chair and put it on top of my head. Because I, and when they finally we made us a, a wire tone, you know, where we could get back. And man, they'd have a barrage there, and if you wasn't covered, you'd get killed. And then, but, but, uh, I got cut once in Odessa by a fan. Scar still there, cut across the stomach.
You just took a knife? Just yeah, it was a little pen knife, but it stuck me pretty good. Um, I've been burned a hundred times. It was spit on you. Uh, had a lot of rides. You stood in the old days. You had, you had more of it. The people were in it more. You know, like small, you smaller. When I wrestled in Texas, you know, smaller crowds, and they'd get with it, you know, pretty good. Especially those Mexicans. Mexican people, you'd get a Mexican wrestler, get him hurt or something. They'd get on your case pretty good. They all carry knives. So, when was the last match that you had? I remember there was a show that you did with Greg Price. We had a we built it as a retirement match. Man, I don't know. Do you remember that one? I retired about ten times. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, uh, I think you worked Billy Black on that match. Yeah, I remember. You know, I wrestled. I wrestled up to about a year and a half ago. About a year and a half. Yeah. I just wrestled on Saturday usually. You know? Yeah. And it worked out good for me, you know, selling my gimmicks and wrestling. You know? And you still do autograph sessions in case anyone's. Yeah. Okay. Sure do. Anything else? A lot. Thank you. Yeah, I, told you sure. every, I told you everything. Everything you told me? 38 years, I told you in what, an hour? <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you. I'm sure everybody else that sees the state's going to thank you. appreciate all the uh, stories that you're sharing. And, and whatever. On behalf of everybody, just thank you for all the effort and time that you put into this sport.